Welcome everybody to today's lecture in digital control. Today we are going to um, finish up this state-based design chapter. So we will recap a little bit um, all the designs that we had until now. Um, we will look into the design of observers of state estimation structures. So the main task in state space control is besides actually constructing the control law um, to reconstruct the state typically the state is an internal internal variable um, and our measurements of of the system output um, is typically not the same as or does not carry the same information as a full as the full state so we need some structure to reconstruct um, the whole state vector. Now let's, um, as a warm up, <coughs> let's go through the designs that we've seen. The state feedback control law is basically written typically in a form like this. So we have the control input u of k as some uh, vector gain k, k transposed here of some coefficients times the state vectors. It's a linear combination of the state vector um, at time k. And then some, um, some additional parts, if you look at that in the block diagram, the controller basically looks um, like that. We have the feedback part um, where the state comes in and is combined in some way and contributes to the control input signal u. And then we have something com coming from the reference, which is scaled by some kw here, for example. And now the main task was in this case here to do pole placement. So we have our open loop system given by the system equation. And we have the system matrix G and the input gain H here. And the system matrix G is a square matrix. And it turns out we've seen that when we compare the eigenvalues of that matrix with uh, the poles of the corresponding transfer function from U to Y, then we see that that's actually the same complex quantities. So um, the complex eigenvalues in general here of G of this square matrix um, are the locations of the poles in the Z domain when we look at the transfer function from U to Y. That's quite interesting. And um, basically that's the strong the direct connection between uh, pole placement and, and basically working in the Z domain um, with pole locations and uh, respectively working with eigenvalues here in the time domain in the, in the form of the state space representation. So our pole placement controller can simply um, achieve pole placement of, the, of this transfer system by just um, providing the correct locations, the corresponding locations of the eigenvalues of the closed loop system matrix. So that's the open loop system matrix here and the closed loop system matrix we get when we insert um, this, this control law in here. Um, and we, we did that, then it basically looks like this line here. So we get a new matrix, which is G minus, and then this product here of the input gain H times K transposed. Remember that um, such a product here is an, a column vector H times some row vector, in our case, uh, K transposed. And the result is, of course, a square matrix of the same size as uh, G. I just draw the, the dimensions here as blocks. So essentially, um, we get, of course, the closed loop matrix, which is this entire parenthesized expression here, um, is, of course, an n by n matrix again. And it has uh, different eigenvalues than G. And these eigenvalues, if we do pole placement design, then these eigenvalues are the, the poles of the closed loop system. Um, and we did that by several approaches, by direct comparison of coefficients of the characteristic polynomial. <coughs> so basically we come up with this expression, zi minus g minus h k transpose. So that's, this one here is the closed loop system matrix here. And um, writing down zi minus these, uh, this matrix and forming the determinant, solving for this, uh, equation of uh, this determinant expression equal to zero for z just gives us the, the eigenvalues of this matrix 
that's the same equation as we get when we want to um, see transform the entire state space system and evaluate the denominator of the closed loop transfer function. That's, that's exactly here the same term that we get. And z is the complex variable, which for the solution uh, p equals zero takes on the values of the eigenvalues of g minus hk transpose. And um, we can do that by comparison of coefficients, as we did earlier as well. And then there is um, Ackermann's formula, which is, uh, achieves exactly the same. And it uses the so-called controllability matrix QC. We've seen what controllability means and observability and the associated matrices here. QC in this case can be used if it's regular. So if the system is controllable, then we can form the inverse of that matrix. And that's needed to solve the Ackermann formula, which has this intriguing structure that uh, we have the inverse of the controllability matrix. And then here we have a very special expression where we actually use characteristic coefficients of the closed loop that we would like to have, the alphas here. And instead of uh, writing down z here as the complex variable, when writing down the usual uh, polynomial form of the characteristic equation here, um, we actually insert the open loop system matrix here. Together with the controllability matrix, this actually yields the correct coefficients k transposed to do this pole placement and to assign the eigenvalues of g minus h k transposed where we want them, so, uh, according to the alphas here. So that's Ackermann's very famous uh, formula. And we can, of course, use it in MATLAB um, with the command Acker. That bit control was achieved exactly by the same uh, procedure as we've seen now, by pole placement. And uh, we have a special location of all the poles in a deadbeat uh, control system, in the closed loop, the closed loop locations, which are all at the origin of the complex Z plane. So the uh, characteristic polynomial has the very uh, simple form Z to the power of N equals zero. So it's an N multiple of that pole in zero. And that's a perfectly valid characteristic polynomial and we can just assign that. And we can do that especially when the system is fully state controllable. And we just did that uh, with the same example system as before. And we just get the corresponding controller feedback gain and match the closed loop transfer uh, stationary gains from the reference to the output um, to be equal to one. And we did that by adjusting this factor KW here. We then looked into an extended version of such a control design, extended in the sense that we do not directly feed in the control error here in the beginning, but instead we take, we, we integrate over that control error quantity over time, or actually aggregate over time. So we just sum up the values from one time step to the next that we get in, uh, in this control error signal E here, W minus Y and we define some aggregate control error v which um, con is constituted of the old aggregate plus the new control error and that effectively produces an integration or an integrator pole in the entire closed loop system or actually in the loop gain here if you look at this in series with um, this structure here so this structure is the same structure as we've just seen um, before in the, in the pole placement design, then we have a gain in series, and then we have here a dynamics which um, incorporates or which realizes um, integral behavior. So we add it to the entire loop gain, which is this guy here. We add it um, as a complete loop gain here, we added this integration. And as you know, um, assuming that we have a plant which has globally proportional behavior, we add an integrator in the loop gain, and hence we get um, globally integrating behavior of the entire loop gain. And that assures, once we establish stability, that assures that we have vanishing position errors. So we have an asymptotic tracking of um, disturbance, rejection of disturbances and track, <coughs> tracking of um, references, of constant references. And um, we just take this structure, read off the formulas. So we have, of course, our system description. We had 
um, this integration relationship for V and we could write that at, an, at time K and K minus one respectively at time K plus one and K. Once we write down all these equations from the block diagram here from this control structure, it turns out that we can come up with a combined system description with one state more. So we host actually this V, this aggregated control error as an additional state in this description. And then it turns out we can actually put that into a form so that um, we get to encapsulate this extended description in the same form as uh, we are used to in, in, in full placement control design. So basically we get an extended state vector, which is one state more, an extended uh, system matrix G hat and all the headed quantities are larger by one in the corresponding sizes of the, of the state. So this one is the extended input, uh, sorry, system matrix, an extended input gain here um, from U and we have one from W here in the last equation. And of course we need to extend the coefficients here in the output equation as well. It's still C transpose times X, uh, but since now we take V into the extended state vector, there has to be a coefficient and this coefficient has to be zero, of course. So writing it with these headed quantities, x hat, g hat, and so on, we actually get to a standard pole placement design system again. It looks exactly the same as before, just that we have uh, these headed quantities everywhere, and we just do a command on the headed quantities. So we need <coughs> the controllability matrix here, q, c hat, which needs to be one larger as well, of course. It's just constructed from all the headed quantities. Um, and um, same here, we always use the extended quantities. Also for controllability verification, we have to check that the rank is full, which means that the rank has to be n plus one here of the controllability matrix QC hat. And by doing that, we've seen um, additionally that um, here we have that if you look at this transfer function, which is the closed loop reference transfer function, we see that automatically we will get um, 4z equals 1. Um, if you look at, at these terms here, we will get uh, this term here will vanish for z equals 1, of course. And then we have exactly the same um, expressions in the numerator and denominator. So that's that evaluates to 1, a stationary gain of 1 automatically without um, solving for some particular value of, of this capital K here, which um, looks like the pre-filter gain that we had. If you look back into the other design, I just scroll up quickly. The other design had a pre-filter gain KW that needed to be matched in order to have stationary gain of one from W to Y. And with that, we could get zero um, reference and uh, zero position error from the reference to the output. But for example, that doesn't hold true if we inject the disturbance somewhere, this disturbance will not be rejected generally fully because um, we just, um, we just uh, determined a gain for the reference path to, be, to, to match the stationary gain, but we do not have the capability generally if the plant here is not integrating already that uh, a disturbance added in here somewhere um, is being rejected in a stationary way. In contrast to that, we do achieve asymptotic tracking when we add integration of the control error and we do not need to explicitly come up with uh, some correct value of capital K here in order to match the gains. Of course, we need K, it's part of, of this K hat transposed, it's part of the unknowns here and it's being determined from the pole placement in order to place all the n plus one poles. But um, in, in, in this sense, it does not have, it doesn't play the role of matching or putting the, the entire gain here to the correct value of one. That's automatically achieved because we have an integration. Right, so um, essentially <coughs> that were these designs. And now, as, as we finished um, these, I would say, classical control designs in the state space representation, um, we have to ask ourselves how we can actually come 
to um, the knowledge of the state vector itself because we we pretty much assumed that we have it before um, now the problem in practice is that the state uh, is basically an inner variable and we discussed some at some with some length that um, the state vector can be chosen or the state coordinates can be chosen freely in some sense so we just have to have enough sufficiently many states to describe our dynamics but we could uh, go to a different coordinate system if you will and hence it's not instantly clear how we can actually measure these uh, states and how we get uh, to some current state x of k when we are only given the measurements y of k. That's actually the only numbers that we get into our digital controller, y of k. So um, we, we can also assume that we know u of k uh, because we just produced that, uh, for example, one time step earlier. So we have u of k and y of k and we may have the system model with g and h. That's what we can assume still and, and see transposed, of course. but we do not know, necessarily know anything directly about x of k. If so, we're lucky, then we don't need an observer. But if we're not, um, and we're just given these measurements, then we need some, some approach, some structured approach to obtain x of k in some uh, reconstructed manner. And that's where observers or estimators come into play. Um, the most famous observer or estimator of such states um, that you probably all have heard of already is the so-called Kalman filter. Um, the Kalman filter is a particular type of, uh, an, uh, of a state estimator. Um, the difference between an observer and an estimator is um, actually only in context, at least from, from our perspective here. That means um, estimator was the name given to this, uh, to this thing that we look at now that we can also call observer. Estimator was the name given to it by um, people from the stochastic community, I would say. So um, people in signal filtering and when you take on a, a stochastic perspective, when you have noise with some, as a random variable entering the system, then you usually call, um, when, you, when you want to do an estimate of some random variables, hence the name, you, you, you construct an estimator. And this estimator um, will take on, in our case, actually the same structure um, as, as when we go about it on a deterministic way. Um, and we actually constructed a deterministic approach when we talked about controllability or observability, especially. In observability, we reconstructed um, the initial state from n sequential measurements of the output, if you remember. That if we could do that, we could come up with equations that connect all these time levels and finally connect back to x of zero. And that's uh, actually what an observer does or can do. That's, that's state observation. So you observe, you reconstruct the state um, x of k, given measurements from x of k on n time steps into the future or later time steps. So this reconstruction problem is, uh, you can do that as uh, on offline data. And now we will look into an observer structure, which is um, this guy here, which uh, we just represent for now by a block. And we will have several variants of how we can realize this block, um, which takes in measurements, which is basically M is just a different way of uh, writing Y here. Y is the one, the single one control um, variable that we're interested in, but we may have different or several measurements, but it's, you see, it's the same structure. We, we may define a different output equation here by C star, some matrix C star times, times the real X of K that gives me M of K, which is a measurement vector for time K. So it's some linear combination or some linear combinations of the state components at that time. Also, we assume that we know the input <coughs> and then um, what this observer should produce is an estimation or the best possible reconstruction in some sense of the state vector X. It will not be the same. Typically, it will not be, especially in, uh, initially, it will not be the same because we just have no idea of the initial values of X uh, at K equals zero, for example. Um, and we will have some estimation of that. 
uh, and we will use this estimation as if, because it's our best guess of the state, so we'll use it instead of taking the true x and feeding that back. So we do not have access to this true x of k, instead we take x hat of k and use that for our control purposes, so we feed that back into our controller. Um, Right, so um, the question is, of course, now how can this observer look like to do uh, really uh, to, to achieve this state reconstruction? So let's dive a little bit into the equations and let's see what that means. The first uh, observer type that we will look into is the so called predictive observer, which is actually the simplest type here. Um, <coughs> and you will see why we call it like that. So um, we assume that. Um, of, of course, we need to reconstruct n many states, just as x of k is, um, is, an, is an n by one vector, we will um, take x hat of k also as an n, n by one vector. So we will take also n many um, estimated states and we will write down some general uh, or generic, if you want, um, different equation in the state space here. So we take x hat k plus one equals some unknown matrix F times x hat, which is the eigendynamics of these state estimates, plus G times U of k, that's just this input path here, with some um, input uh, gain G, which we have to determine. And then we take uh, a particular structure here, which, which looks like that. We take C star times x, which is just m of k here okay so we we need x uh, we need c star times x here because we cannot just directly take x um, <coughs> otherwise we wouldn't need an observer so we do have some limiting um, uh, lim limit here given by the measurement matrix c star so this product here gives us the measurements m of k and we multiply that by some matrix p which is also part of our control design or has to come up from our control design or actually observer design. Um, and that gives us some dynamic evolution of these states x, x hat. And now the question is, of course, how can we make these estimated states in some sense track the real states x of k here? So what we would we would like to have in the best way, in, in the best case, if we manage to do that, is that um, we said initially we have no idea about the initial state of x typically. Um, and so, so we cannot expect that in the beginning these states will align. They will be some, some way apart. But what we would like to have is um, if we look at the differences between the estimated, sta estimated states and the real states, we can just formulate that even if we cannot directly measure these real states for control purposes, still we can um, formulate uh, the differences in this coupled dynamic system here and analyze um, how these differences, the estimation errors in the states, how they behave. And what we would like to do is we would like to have them behave in an asymptotically stable manner so that they decay and in the best case they should decay down to zero. If we achieve that, then we know that after some time x hat actually approached asymptotically x and we are very close or we, we even get asymptotically closer as time goes on. That would be our uh, primary goal to do um, asymptotic state um, reconstruction or estimation. Now let's look at uh, how we can achieve that. We can just formulate this thought. Um, so we take um, we, we formulate the state reconstruction error and we call it x tilde, which is x minus x hat. And now we just start substituting these expressions here, um, basically this, uh, this state reconstruction error, um, into um, these expressions of our observer dynamics and see what happens. Um, the goal now is that we actually formulate um, our control system. You see that. You see that basically here we have h, uh, sorry, we have x k plus one. That's our control, uh, sorry, our system uh, equation, our usual model equals g x plus h u. And now we just take the trick that we add and subtract f times x. Um, so it stays, of course, in sum it stays zero, but we just 
do that in order to um, ease our, our substitutions here. That's just a small trick. It's actually not necessary, but it makes things a little bit clearer. Um, and then we take uh, this equation here and subtract this equation from our system equation. And what happens now is that we get x minus x hat at time k plus one on the left hand side, which is of course the state reconstruction error x tilde at the next time step. So we just substitute here. We eliminated x, x hat here. So we write this final system here is the, <coughs> the evolution of the state reconstruction error x tilde. Um, so it's, it's, it has some system matrix. It turns out that the system matrix of this evolution is actually F itself. And then we have some ingress, some, some, some terms, which are in X of K and in U of K. And now the point is that um, if, we, if we want to um, make this control error independent of um, what we do in the state. So if we take X of K uh, and, and if the system basically um, moves around in the state space and X of K is non-zero and goes all over the place, um, if we want this activity not to influence the errors of our estimation, then we need to make this matrix here zero. And G is given, we cannot change the system, the plant, F is um, not given. We are actually in charge of, in the observer design, we can actually choose F. And as well, we, can, we have degrees of freedom here. We can choose <coughs> P times C star here. And uh, so, so that's actually an, a possible task that we can uh, zero out this matrix. Let's go on here. Down back here, we also would like to make the state estimation error independent of whatever goes on in the input of the system. If we drive the system wildly with large inputs, this should ideally not affect our um, state estimation or state reconstruction errors. They should, in a nice and benign fashion, decay towards zero. So if we manage to, um, to set this vector to zero, then this dependency is gone. Um, and H is, of course, given that's uh, part of the plant model, but G was left for us to decide about. If you look back up, G is just the input gain that we assign here in our artificial dynamics. So um, let's just choose G equals H, then this, uh, this term here zeroes out. And if we also choose here F equals G minus PC star, like in this form, if you insert that here, then that just zeroes out this entire expression. So we are left with an autonomous system, which just depends, or whose evolution just depends on the matrix F and its eigenvalues. And obviously we would like to have these eigenvalues um, inside the unit circle somewhere so that we get um, asymptotic decay, that this is an asymptotically stable system in the error variables. And if we do that, so basically we take these two choices to zero out these dependencies to the real state and the real input. And additionally, still we, we have F and uh, this connection established. So F is just replaced by G minus PC star here, here in the front. And additionally, what we would like to do um, is, so we can, we can have a look at the, at the next few equations here, but um, before doing that, what we would like to do now, F is gone, but if you, if you replace that here, um, we have G minus PC star here in the front. And now you see what actually happens. So uh, just strike that out boldly. So if we take these equations and insert them into 633, then we zero out this term and we zero out this term and F, so I'll just rewrite that here. Then we get X tilde K plus one equals G minus PC star times X tilde of K. And that's a very nice um, result in the sense that um, it told us exactly what we need to do with our degrees of freedom that of, of the system dynamics that we took up there. 
and we get some form which looks similar, <coughs> although not identical, but it looks similar to the problem that we get when we want to do pole placement. If you remember just in the beginning of today's lecture in the, in the wrap up, um, if you do pole placement with some system with state vector feedback, then you will get the structure x k plus one equals g minus h k transposed times x and then plus something the input terms but essentially what we solved by Ackermann for example was given matrix g and vector h we would want we wanted to find the vector k transposed components in order to assign the eigenvalues of this um, entire bracketed matrix to some given locations that we would like to have. And these given locations, of course, they are stable, they are inside a unit circle somewhere um, and uh, come from some specifications. If you look at this here, at this um, structure, G is given and C star is also given. That's C star actually models how our um, sensors are being mounted on the system. C star could take um, could, could be defined so that we have one sensor for um, a displacement, one sensor for a velocity or an acceleration, and so on. Um, so it takes some some information, combines it from the states, and uh, models the output quantity that we get. So C star is given once we decide for a particular sensor setup. And G is, of course, given from the plant dynamics itself. P is unknown. And it looks almost the same as on the right-hand side here, just that if you look closely, the, the order of these factors is, is flipped compared to here, in, in the sense that the unknowns are on the left here, and here the unknowns are on the right. And that, of course, does make a difference. We cannot just say it's the same. It's not the same, because these products usually don't commute. but it's um, compatible in a sense that um, we can use the same approaches um, like we did before for pole placement. We can use Ackermann, we can use uh, comparison of coefficients to actually assign eigenvalues to this matrix here. And these eigenvalues should be stable because these eigenvalues determine how our control, uh, sorry, our observation or estimation error of the states decays. Now, if we substitute that back, um, so we do not express this dynamics x tilde anymore, but again, we go back into x hat. So that's basically this formula here. x hat is um, now our estimation of the state, and we evolve it according to this law. And it turns out, well, this matrix F here, respectively G minus PC star, comes up here as a system matrix. And then we have terms driving it um, h times u of k plus p times m of k. So we need these values to evolve the state, of course, um, x hat. That's what we would like to compute in essentially in a system simulation that we run in real time. So we just, in each time step, update our estimates of the state um, by using the last known value of the state estimate, the current input value u of k, and the current measurements of uh, m of k. Okay. Now we can, um, of course, formulate um, these these terms uh, in different ways. So we can um, write the equation like so, like so, so that we have um, the measurements here, and we see that p comes up in here and out here. So we can actually collect p. We can write that's just alternatively it's exactly the same equation just uh, written in a different way um, so x hat k plus one equals g of uh, x hat so that's just like a, that 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 here is like the system equation that's the same terms g times our estimate of x plus h times u and then we have an additional input that's how you can um, how i can look at this um, at this problem where we have some matrix P, which actually comes from this pole placement design here, this matrix P here, multiplies 
this parenthesized expression. And this expression is the measurements minus C star X hat. And of course, C star times X hat are the modeled measurements. That's basically M hat, if you take on the same notation. So um, we take here the, the measured outputs and subtract from that um, the model outputs. If those are the same, in, if, if these quantities are the same, then of course this difference is zero. And that means that um, we do not have any contribution from this part here. And we just simulate our states one time step further with our system um, matrices G and H. Then we do not need to do any correction, of course, because our model outputs are aligned with the actual measurement outputs. And that actually um, tells you or shows you that X hat um, is basically in line with um, the true states if the system is observable. That's just what observability says that um, if you don't have differences in your measurements or in your outputs, um, then over several time steps, then that means that your states are aligned as well. That's just um, another way to frame observability. Now this observer is called um, predictive observer, as we have in the title of this section. Why is it, is it called like that? Well, if you look at, um, at the structure here, we have x hat k plus one, and that's being determined sort of in a, as a prediction. So essentially you take, you evolve your last values, you evolve the last or the, the current um, input u of k, and you, yeah, and so, so basically you evolve that over time, you predict that based on a model, but also what you do is, um, you base your decision of correction on time level k. So whenever you find a new x hat here at some time level k plus one, um, you only used the last, so, so one time step earlier um, of the measurement. So essentially from that old measurement, you predicted now the, um, the state estimate and that's, <laughs> this one step ahead prediction and gives the name of the predicted observer. So it's really no magic going on with predictions here. It's uh, just that we have a difference of one time level, which is in this case actually, um, well, it's, it's simple to do, to, to write down these equations now. It was a very straightforward approach how we got there, but um, it, we can probably do better. And that's actually the next one, the so-called current observer. But before diving into that, um, let's think a little bit about this matrix that we want to assign here, G minus PC star. So we want to find some coefficients P so that this matrix, which is this matrix F, <clears throat> um, is of course stable. And also what we can say in some way is um, how fast we would like the, the, the observation errors to die out. That's additional specifications that we need to that we need to supply here. So we need to specify how fast these aerodynamics should die out. And typically what, uh, basically it's a coarse rule of thumb here. Um, typically if you have a system with uh, some specifications for the controlled behavior, you will want to your, your uh, estimation errors to die out somewhat faster. And that's, that's always, um, it's not a rigid factor that we have here, but it's basically an order of magnitude, something like, like factor of two, five or 10 faster in terms of continuous um, time dynamics of time constants. That's basically um, a typical choice. <coughs> so, um, that's, that's how we would like to solve um, or to, to assign these poles. How we do that, we'll, sh we'll show you in a second. Um, let's dive into a simple example. I think we had this example already before numerically. So we have this second order system given in uh, controllability canonical form here. Um, we take the outputs here. Uh, the output equation is the difference, so it's um, one, one times X. And um, we can write down 
this characteristic equation for the uh, for the observer design, we have uh, we assume here that um, the measurement here is, is is the same as the output. We do not have more measurements, so it's only one measurement that we have. So um, C transpose is of course also C star is equal to C star here. So that, that would be this entry. P is then only a vector, and um, we write down Z i minus G plus PC star, which is if you parenthesize it, it would be this G minus PC star or PC transposed. Um, we evaluate these terms and it turns out that we get this matrix and we would like to formulate the determinant of that matrix. So it's just the product of the main diagonal terms minus uh, the off diagonal term product for the two by two case. And that gives us this polynomial expression here, or this, yeah, this polynomial in Z with some new coefficient, uh, with the unknown coefficients P1 and P2 here coming up in various locations. Um, now, if you would like to, um, we collect that, we collect uh, the like powers of Z to get our characteristic polynomial in this form um, with the unknown parameters in it, P1 and P2. And <clears throat> in example 6.1, we had closed loop poles at 0 0.5 plus minus 0 0.5 J. Now we choose the observer poles both as a, basically a real double pole at 0 0.2. It will be fine if you, if you solve problems like that. I mean, you have, in reality, you have to, to, to verify your choices always with uh, simulations with relevant errors in the system, for example, or with the real system. Um, but uh, it's fine if you choose 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 here. It's, it's really a rule of thumb and it should be just faster in that sense, closer to the origin somewhat um, than uh, your closed loop poles of, uh, of the system dynamics itself. So we, we choose this, these pole locations for the error dynamics, which are faster. Um, and that's just this expression respectively collected in like powers of Z, we get these numeric values of the desired polynomial. And now we match coefficients between these desired coefficients and the coefficients of our structure. So of course one and one has to match up and then we match um, these, these two coefficients, solve for P1 and P2, and that gives us um, the values minus eight respectively 6.6. So we have this coefficient vector and that's all we needed to do for our observer design. Now what we have to do when we realize this observer is um, we have to store our uh, vector of estimated states x hat of k and evolve that over time by solving this equation in each time step. That takes, you could say that takes a little bit more memory and a little bit more um, computational power, um, but this this simple con this these simple estimators or observers they they really do not have large impact on computational requirements. You can do that on any microcontroller um, if you have a few states and you just have to evolve that over time. That will work out usually. Right, so what you need to do there is um, you take the old value of x hat, do this matrix vector multiplication, then you multiply h with the current input value u of k, and you take the measurements m of k, subtract c transpose x hat of k, and multiply that by p, and that all gives you the next value of x hat. You can, of course, for, for our purposes here, we can do that in Simulink, um, or just rewrite it into an into a state space system altogether. Right, so um, that's that's just two the two forms of the equations how we can write them with g times x hat respectively with f times um, x hat and then we just have y in there directly when we pull in basically these terms into here. So that's how one possible possible implementation of an observer looks like that's the so-called predictive observer because we take the old measurement which is <clears throat> goes in here y of k or m of k in this case um, goes in here and produces x hat k plus one now 
if you think that you you are in charge of implementing a state observer and a controller as well what you can do is the following you organize basically what the, con the digital controller does in in its time step and the first thing you do uh, you, you usually obtain the measurements at, as, the, as the first step in your procedures so you take in the newest measurements because then you have new data and you can do new stuff so you take in the newest measurements and now it would be great if you can update your current estimate x hat of um, in your observer structure with this new um, measurement with this information that you just got from freshly from the plant at the same time level basically and then take this new state and feed that back into uh, your feedback control structure in the hope for some more accurate results um, and because it just used more current information so let's try to do that let's see we have to change a little bit our structures um, and we do it in the following way so the, the goal is that um, we will uh, write down essentially uh, well we just spoke about the goal so we want to have mk plus one if you write it in this um, at this time level to be used which is um, the most current um, measurement that you assume having to actually establish an improved version of x hat k plus one and we go about that in some kind of two-step fashion. So first of all, we define our system again. We have our measurement uh, equation here. And now we um, write the following. We take um, states, artificial states Z that we, um, that we model, and we just predict them based on the old um, estimated states that we have. So G times X hat, plus h times u of k, That's, um, that would be, if you remember, um, the correct prediction for x hat at k plus one, if we would not have any measurement error. So if, if, if the measurement would be perfectly aligned with um, the model output. So we call that c of k plus one for now. And now what we do is we explicitly write down, we write down x hat k plus one should be z k plus one, plus, and now this correction term here is the matrix P again, times, and now we take the new difference of, um, uh, of the measurement and the model output. And here we formulate the model output at Z K plus one, as if it would be the actual estimated state. So that's basically the estimated new uncorrected state and um, we formulate the difference between that state and this, the, the measurement that we just drew. And uh, you see here, this, this line here is actually not a difference equation because it doesn't couple different time levels. Only, X, uh, only time level k plus one comes up here. So it's just really um, an algebraic relation telling us how to correct x hat when we are given z and the current measurements and uh, model outputs here. So that's just a new bunch of equations and we just substitute similar to before. So also now we come up with the reconstruction error, same way as before. And um, after some manipulations, <coughs> I will not dive into too much detail there, we just essentially formulate x tilde k plus one and we see that we get to um, a new closed loop um, matrix formulation here, which involves G minus P times C star times G. A new uh, multiplication of G comes up here in the end. That basically comes from the fact that here we took in one additional step through the system matrix by doing this prediction by essentially using CK plus one and ck plus one has g times x hat. That's the difference to before. So we have this product g times x hat instead of x hat directly here, what we had in the predictive observer. So from this difference, we get an additional factor of g here. Um, we also choose <coughs> um, essentially um, the other coefficients in, in that structure that we've seen before. Um, to cancel out the other terms. So we are just left with, with this autonomous equation here 
x tilde equals some closed loop matrix times x tilde over here. Just that this structure looks a little bit different. But the nice thing about this is it, it's not more complicated than before. Um, C star is given and G is also given. So on the right hand side of this product, we have the given quantities which are coming from the model. And on the left hand side of this product, there is the unknown matrix. So it's exactly the same structure as we had um, before and we can use standard pole placement techniques again. We'll discuss in a minute how in detail that looks like. Um, right, now if you, if you look at, at this matrix, um, what we additionally have to make sure here is that um, a, a modified um, observability condition has to be fulfilled. Namely, uh, we call that the observability matrix QO prime to indicate that it's a different one. And if you compare these entries of this observability matrix to uh, the, the usual one, you see that we have one more power of G here multiplied on each of the blocks from the right. Um, so you, it, it's basically the usual observability matrix multiplied from the right by G again. And also this matrix has to have full rank in order to produce this type of, of, of observer or to enable this type of observer. Now, <coughs> we can write down all these terms and uh, substitute these, these equations into each other. So to express x hat as um, basically writing um, it as a function of x hat u, the newest measurements at the new time level and um, x hat and u again. So we eliminated z here um, in this particular form. And again, it doesn't matter which form you use. You can of course write your observer equations in your, in your MATLAB or in your program code like this by only using x hat. You could just as well write these equations. So you evolve the state z and just write x hat of k plus one um, as some form of output equation basically here. So the choice is really yours. Um, there are several ways to write down the same equations of course. And these equations, they, we, didn't, we did not extend the system in the sense that we have more states. We still have n states here, but we took in, uh, we formulated this, um, this term here where we have the measurements minus the system outputs. Um, we formulated that at the next time level compared to um, the time levels that we had in the predictive observer. And um, we did that by hoping for um, using this new information and being able to improve our state estimates in that, in that sense. Um, let's have a look at an example. <coughs> the same example equations here, the same system as before. Now we write the current observer design polynomial here, which has this additional matrix G multiplied from the right here on this term. Um, that gives us, of course, different values in the, in the matrix expression and in the determinant. Um, and we do the same again. We uh, do a comparison of coefficients with this new observer polynomial, and we get two slightly different values, uh, two different values here in the observer gain P. Um, that's then the final results, and um, we can, uh, write down these, these uh, structures and these um, different equations directly in Simulink or in a snippet of code and actually simulate our observer in parallel to some plant simulation. That's usually how you construct a control system where you have the controller, you have an observer block, just pretty much like um, the, the block diagram that I showed you in the beginning. Okay, now we looked into these two types of observers and um, it's, it's, it's really um, the simplicity of the implementation or um, you, you just have to test which one may work better. If it pays off to go for the a little bit more involved uh, current observer or if you use the simpler predictive observer, if that's good enough for your application, you just try it out usually in Simulink and do some test simulations to see um, which one works better. 
Um, the current observer is a little bit more tricky to implement, especially in MATLAB or in Simulink, for example, when you want to wire up this observer with a state feedback controller, you might end up, uh, you have to choose your signals and where you take out the signals wisely. We'll do that. Um, I think it's somewhere in an exercise where, uh, in an exercise example, where you look into the current observer. Um, but it's definitely a good exercise for yourself to try it out on your own to wire up some of these simple examples directly um, in MATLAB Simulink and see how you can wire it in the correct way. Because that, that takes a little bit uh, of, of uh, some closer look um, where you take out, at which time level essentially you take out the values of the uh, headed state quantities, the state estimates. All right, these two variants of, of the observer reconstruct the entire observer, uh, the, the entire state vector, so n many states, which is fine, but not always the best choice. Um, imagine that you have a very expensive and very good sensor, which directly measures one quantity, for example, a displacement to high accuracy without any noise or any other trouble. Um, you would not want the observer to actually um, destroy the accuracy of that measurement in the sense that if you get, if you have one of your states, x1, for example, if that would be the displacement that you directly want to measure with the, with the sensor, and if you can do that, if you install that sensor to measure that particular state, um, then what an observer usually will do is it will take in the measurement and then it will do um, it, it will run its dynamics and provide you with some consistent estimates, but um, this estimate may, may actually be worse than your measurement. It may be less accurate, especially if you have model errors and so on, because the model actually then affects where the estimate is. It's not directly identically equal to the measurement. That's, that's not what the observer does. The observer produces um, something that is uh, some, some, some estimates of the states that are close to the true states in the sense of the outputs, but not necessarily perfectly um, on, the, um, on the output quantities. If you have that situation, and if you want to um, make an, a more clever observation of the remaining states, then we are in the case of a reduced order or of a minimum order observer. And um, let's just um, take the following approach here. We now looked into two variants of how we construct full order observers, the, the observers that we've seen until now, full order in the sense that they reconstruct the entire state vector. And um, we try to use that toolbox again. So we established that we have some closed loop matrix F that we want to, to do pole placement for. Um, and basically then we, we will see that these uh, the state reconstruction errors decay in a nice way and um, that we can get X hat out of this box and uh, work with it for, for a feedback controller. Now we are faced with the situation, as I said before, um, you, you assume that you have measured some part of your state vector, let's say the first state or some states in the system, that you have measured them very accurately. Um, accurately in the sense that there is no noise that you would like to filter out, um, but it's really a nice measurement, an expensive sensor um, and a well-conditioned measurement. And we call this measurement, or this partition of the state that we measure, we call XA. And we sort our states in this way so that XA is uh, the first few states, M many states, <coughs> that, that are measured directly. So our measurement equation is just uh, basically the identity matrix, um, we have it here, the identity matrix M by M, and then we have a separation and, and then on the right of that uh, block to the right of that identity matrix is zero block of m many lines and n minus m many row, uh, columns. Of course, that just copies basically xa here into the measurements, into the measurement vector. So that's 
Uh, that's the situation that we want to look at now. And of course, now the situation is that um, we do not know about XB. Okay, so that's uh, XB is unknown to us and, and XB hat, in fact, should be reconstructed by, by this observer. Um, and that's the minimum order observer that will become an observer which has only um, as many dynamical states as uh, the size of XB here, which is M minus N minus M. And so sorry, I just see that here it should be XB, dimension of XB is N minus M. And um, only that many states are necessary in that minimum order observer. And all the other components are taken from the measurements directly because we assume that these measurements are as good as it gets. So um, in order to, to use or to, to get to some pole placement strategy with this specific structure, let's um, divide our system equation in this way. So we partition our system matrix and our input vector corresponding to, uh, to this state partitioning. Um, that could be different lengths, of course. These blocks on the main diagonal will be square and these may be rectangular blocks here and this one is a square block again. Um, so this one is M by M. This one is N minus M by N minus M. And then associated we have the filling blocks here. So that's really just we cut through our system matrix and, and assign these new uh, labels here, these new denominations um, to, to work with these blocks directly. And um, we can just write actually this first difference, this first set of difference equations, xA k plus 1 equals gAA times xA of k plus gAB times xB of k plus hA times u of k. And the second row um, similarly. <clears throat> That's exactly what is written down here. And now if you look at, um, at these terms here, um, we now may look at um, each term individually and ask ourselves the question, what of these terms, which of these terms do we know from measurement directly and which one do we not know? And it turns out x a k plus one is just the newest measurement. Think of the current observer. So that's directly measured. That's that we can consider this quantity known. Also, of course, we know about x a of k, and we know about the input, and hence this entire product. What we do not know is x b. So now we put all the known values to the left hand side here, and we end up with this equation here. On the right hand side, we have the estimated state in it. So we don't know the value of the right hand side or at least not the value of XB here at K, um, but we do know all of the terms on the left hand side. <coughs> right, um, we can also call these known quantities the measurable quantities and the unmeasurable quantities are given here on the right. So we just took them apart and um, if we now take look up here, the second line here of the state update, so xbk plus one equals gba times xa plus gbb xb plus hb times u, then we get this equation here, that's 649. And again here, we look at which quantities are known. We, we consider that XA here is perfectly known or directly measured and that HB times U of K is known. If you compare that to a full order observer, there we had the state equation of the plant, which looked like this, just a simple state equation of the entire plant. Um, so we had on the left hand side XK plus one, the next um, unknown value of the state equals the current but unknown value of the state plus h times u, which we considered known. And now we consider more terms known. We consider this term and we consider the u term known. So we just collect, recollect the terms in this way. We have xb k plus one equals gbb xb 
plus some known terms. So we just substitute essentially into our early design these quantities that we collect collect here into these uh, brackets and treat them as if they were just h times u of k. Likewise, the output equation <coughs> for the full order observer was we had the measured quantity on the left hand side and on the right hand side we had the, the unknown state quantity. Now we can uh, from from the equation up here that we that we wrote down here this one actually um, we rewrite that here and we see that the measured portion here we can we can put all the known and measured values on on the left hand side here and isolate um, the, this linear combination of the unknown states on the right hand side and we get the same structure as in our output equation of the full order observer so Basically, by um, some clever substitutions, we established uh, the same structure here for the state xb as in our uh, design before. And likewise, for the output equation, we would substitute with uh, this entire formula. Let's analyze that. Um, for the full order observer, we get x hat k plus 1 equals g minus pc star x hat of k plus h times u of k that's the known input terms plus p times m of k if we do the substitutions and we get into the substitutions in a second um, from from this table down there then we will write down our estimated additional or unmeasured portion of the state xb hat as um, similar to here essentially gbb minus p times gab this p here is uh, the unknown gain that we design now for with pole placement all the other partitions of the g matrix are known then we have um, the known values here of gba xa plus g uh, plus hb times u just like this term here we just have more of uh, more terms contributing here but all of these are considered known and then we have p times the measurement and by taking the substitution above we see that it's p times this entire expression here and that's actually the final result already for this minimal order observer which um, produces a dynamic estimate of xb hat it takes xa directly from the measurement and copies it basically into xa hat and puts those two together to achieve the entire estimation of x hat these uh, these uh, terms here that we see in the left for the full order state observer are in this design swapped by these um, terms in the minimum order case. So instead of G, we have to use GBB. Instead of H times U, we have to use this entire term here. Instead of M of K here, we have to use this entire expression of the known variables here. And also the P matrix is of course different in size. Here we assigned n many eigenvalues. It's an n by m matrix, and m is the number of measurements, by the way. And in the minimum order case, we have n minus m times m as the size of this matrix. Let's analyze the dynamics of this observer a little bit. We will take our entire system equation here, 651, which defines the dynamics of xb hat what we are up to is the following. We want to isolate this quantity xb hat k plus one minus p times the measurement at k plus one on the left hand side and we try to find the same quantities in these coefficients here on the right hand side at time step k. This entire expression respectively this expression 
that's the same expressions, the same signal, but once at time level k and once at time level k plus one. This orange signal we call eta or eta hat for the hatted case for xb hat minus p times xa and eta without hat for the true state xb minus p times m. By doing that, we get to a somewhat shorter expression here in um, new signals eta hat k plus one equals some matrix, some closed loop matrix with p in it times eta hat plus some matrix times measurements plus some matrix with p, here is also p in it, um, times the inputs. And that's actually um, a relatively compact form to write down the, the necessary equations. As an internal state of, uh, of this minimum order observer, you can take this eta hat, evolve that with this equation over time, and from this substitution here, formulate xb. If you know eta hat, then you can reformulate to xb hat, of course. You know xa, because that's your measurement directly, hence you know the entire state x hat. Let's analyze the dynamics a little bit. This estimation error is actually, um, if, you, if you subtract eta from eta hat, what you will get is you, you have the same term here, so this cancels, and you will actually get xp minus xp hat as, um, as difference between these two, as between eta and eta hat. Doing that and going into these equations above, you will actually find that um, your state estimation error in the unknown states xp and xp hat is just given by this matrix and you design this matrix of course to be stable similar as to the case before but note that this matrix and of course the dimension of this vector is only n minus m in size so this vector is n minus m by one and that's the corresponding square matrix here so only that many eigenvalues can be and need to be assigned here yeah, and this this last equation can be rewritten in the in the control error and in, in the estimation error here. And um, similar to the substitutions above, we also have a different observation criterion, and it looks like this: we have different portions here of the G matrix coming up. You have the matrix G B B here taking the role of the original G matrix in the full order design. And you have to check whether um, this uh, observability matrix has full rank. And this full rank should be n minus m. When you found this matrix P in this design, in this minimum order of design, you know basically this equation. And you can rearrange the eta hat equation, as I said before, to express xp hat directly. So you take in eta hat and you take in p times xa, that's the measurement, and you consider that exactly the part of the state vector, the first part of the state vector, to express x hat b. And finally, that's your system equation for the states eta. With all these quantities in place, you feed in the measurements here, the inputs and the old uh, eta hat values to get the new eta hat values, and you get that part, that estimated part of, uh, of the state vector with this equation. All right, now the point is, um, I stressed before several times that if you have um, very good measurements of this part of the state vector, then you usually, it will be a good idea to go for a reduced or minimum order observer. But if these measurements are not good, or if they are if they are noisy, then it's probably not a good idea to go for a minimal order observer. The reason is the following. Um, before I get into this entire um, block diagram, if you have x hat uh, x a as as noise corrupted, what will happen is actually the following. Assume that you have some control design with some k transposed and that goes into um, your feedback control system. So you have some kw and 
you, you basically take in x hat here. Okay, so and, and then you have the plant and you have your minimum order observer and you feed u into the minimum order observer and you take out the measurements and y comes out here. All right, so if you have noise corrupting your measurement, so if let's say the measurement is additionally corrupted by some noise n of k. If you do that, uh, if you have the situation, then what happens is the following. You will get um, m of k as your initial part in x hat. I just write it down, x hat was x a hat x b hat, but that was actually m of k and x b hat. Um, and an observer or an estimator is usually some clever approach to actually filter your measurements, to take in filtered information from your measurements. And that's what a full observer does, a full order observer. A reduced order observer does that as well, but only in the estimated part xb hat. It takes in the values in the measurement vector and directly copies that into the first part of the estimated states xa hat. And if you, are no, if you have noise acting on M, then this noise ends up in your estimate without any reduction, without filtering. That itself, well, you could say that's not a problem, but the point is that this noise actually hits onto the actuator channel by, a feed, by this feedback gain here. You multiply some values, some coefficients on the first part of the state vector where the noise fully comes in here over this path. And in that case, um, you will get basically noise on this signal and noise directly on the actuator. And noise on the actuators, if it's large, it can be loud or it can destroy mechanical actuators, for example. Um, so that's, that's what you have to take care of. You have to check that in your application if this is an issue. Um, and that can be a reason to decide against using a minimal order observer. Okay. That being said, let's um, finally have a look <coughs> on, the, uh, on the block diagram in its full glory um, of this minimum order observer. So we take, uh, we assume we have a usual uh, state feedback controller here. We take in the, the estimated state x hat um, to, to drive this controller. The plant is up here and down here, this large box is the minimal order observer. And with all the substitutions, we collected them here into these gain boxes. So that's essentially what happens. And that's how you can basically wire it up in Simulink, for example. So you take out the measurement vector. This measurement vector goes into several places. Um, first of all, let's, let's follow this line where the first, the first M many um, components, so the, the measurement vector itself, which is the first part of the state vector, that's we, that is what we see here on this line down here and here up here in this gain, we see the identity matrix of size M and that's uh, that produced the takes <coughs> in these values, these measurements, and that puts it in here into the final X hat into the first M many components. And you see that all the other gains that come up here have zero in the first part. So there is no other contribution than really just this part, the measurements are directly taken into these first M many state estimates. So this uh, actually, this, this signal here or this, this description is actually on this, on this edge here. All right, so that's where we get, where we take the state measurements into our, into our state estimate. Um, all the other terms, you see here that we um, have, have this gain, GBA minus PGAA. Um, and here in here, we collect all the terms that we sum up to define eta hat k plus one. This eta hat k plus one is stored by one, uh, or one sampling uh, time. And then it's uh, eta hat of k. And that's used here for this feedback term. And eta hat of k is taken similar to the term down here, where we basically push through this, in, this signal here into the first m many components in the final state. Here we take eta hat and put it into 
the state estimate here. That's one of the contributions in the second block. But there is another contribution from, coming from the formulas, which is P times XA that comes from, from this gain. XA is on this line here, it's M of K times P, and that is added to the last row here to eta hat coming from above here. Right, and of course, um, in the eta um, system equation here, we um, have this contribution, we have the feedback from eta, and we have the contribution from U of K. That's all collection of the uh, formulas that we just saw above. So this, um, you see, it's, it's uh, quite complicated from its total structure, um, but it's only that the terms themselves are more complex. The, the, the essential structure is the same as before, um, with the addition that we treat these two parts of, this, of the final result differently and add them up in the correct places. That's the, really the only difference. Inside here, we essentially have the same terms at work and we describe this dynamics in this eta hat. It's perfectly fine if you directly describe it in xb hat, you can do that as well. You just have to come up with the correct blocks and gains directly coming from the equations above. All right, so that actually brings me now to um, the example, I think it's 6.6, with the system equation should be up here, um, or just on the page before, and um, the output equation. And our task is that we have a system equation that looks like this, basically the double integrator here, an input, uh, input gain, these values, and we take out the first state. And we want to design a state vector feedback gain so that we have a closed loop dynamics uh, with these poles at 0 0.6 plus minus 0.4 J. And now we measure the first state accurately. So we design a minimal order observer. And in this case, since we measure one state, our state dimension in total n equals two, of course. We measure one state, so we have one measurement, and n minus m is, of course, also equal to one. n minus m is the size of the dynamic system uh, or the number of eta values that we've seen now in the design of the minimal order observer. So with this minimal order observer, the error signal should exhibit a deadbeat response. So it should be a very fast, very aggressive observer. Um, and let's see how we manage that. So we, we, first of all, we look at the controllability and observability conditions for the entire system. We have full ranks everywhere, that's fine. Now we do the controller design, simple pole placement um, for the given two poles that we have. We want to have this desired polynomial coming from um, multiplying out these complex pole locations. Um, we, so we get these coefficients minus 1.2 and plus 0.52. And associated to that, we get the entries in the k-transposed vector with these numbers. We also come up with the pre-filter gain, which evaluates to a value of eight. So our control law can be written like that. We have k-transposed or minus k-transposed times our estimated state vector. And we've, re we've written it already now in, in this form so that we take in x1 equals the measurement y of k. We assume that this is the same and this is noise free and, and we have an accurate measurement. And then we have x2 hat of k. Actually, this should not be bold because it's just a scalar in our notation because um, it just partitions this state vector that we have into two scalars. Plus eight times w, which is or w of k actually, which um, completes this, this control design. Now for the observer design to actually obtain um, x2 hat and this entire block here, or this entire uh, x hat vector, <coughs> we partition our uh, system matrix and our input gain into um, these denominated blocks here. And you see we have now, it's very simple because we partition this two by two system or this, this two state system um, into one state known, one state unknown. So it's really just the scalars in the four sectors here. We want to have a dead beat response. So this first order system that we want to assign is simply z to the power of one equals zero. We insert into equation 661 to get actually this pole placement equation for the minimum order case. 
and we just take actually the corresponding values from up here. So zi minus gbb, just look here, gbb equals one. So that's this, this guy here, plus p times gab. gab is this upper right block, 0 0.2, this one, and p is just a scalar. Please don't mistake that with uh, some, some polynomial off. That's not the case here. It's uh, the scalar p times 0.2. Maybe we should write that in the other way around. So 0.2 times p. Let's write it like this. And that simply um, gives us, um, with comparison of coefficient, we make this c to the power of zero coefficient, which is zero. Um, we equate that with this entire term here, so we get to p equals five. Good, and that actually already concludes the design. Um, we co collect all the remaining terms that we need. Eta hat, which is just <coughs> scalar in this case, it's just written here in this uh, general form where we may have a general vector, uh, eta hat. So essentially, after doing the substitutions, we see eta hat at k plus of k plus one is minus five times the measurement plus 0 0.1 times u. And uh, x2 hat is eta hat plus p times y. So we can just shorten that in the, the concrete way here. And then we have our block diagram, which looks a little bit nicer with some compact numbers here. So essentially, you see the same structure, of course. We have our controller, which accepts two states and the input uh, reference here. So um, we just yeah, there's just nothing new here, basically. The plant itself is here, and uh, y of k is fed into the minimum order observer, u of k as well, and you see again y of k goes through on, in the first result uh, component here in x1 hat. It's just 1 times y plus 0 times eta, so it's really just copying the, the measured state here into the first component, and the other component is one times zeta hat plus five times y. And that's it basically. That realizes this minimum order observer. This observer is aggressive in the sense that we have uh, dead beat behavior for the second state to make it compliant after one time step already. Uh, so in the absence of a, uh, of a model error, we will get, um, very fast convergence, um, and we will have only a first order observer system down here, which only estimates the velocity of this um, of the system. Okay, there is a question. Uh, the observer dynamics should be chosen faster than the system dynamics. Is there a reasoning why we should not construct a dead beat observer always? Definitely. Because when we do observer design and when we do control design, then there is the so-called separation principle that allows us to do these two designs apart from each other. We do not have to do that together. So um, you've seen that our formulas above constructed an observer in, the, in that way so that um, actually only an initial discrepancy between our estimates of the observer of, of the states and the true states um, could be there and it should decay always towards zero if we did a stable design. And no matter what we do with the system, we should never see any growing um, estimation error again. That is only true, sadly, uh, when our system model is perfect. If the true system does not behave the same as as our model, as our matrices G and H that we work with to model our system, then we do not have this, this perfect property. Uh, what we do is they're actually a control design. I've sketched it last time. Essentially what we do is the following. We have our system and then we basically have some observer action happening here when we take in some, this is basically P times here we have C star, so this is Y hat of K, and we have our true system coming from up there, that's Y of K, 
and now don't nail me down on the correct signs. That's just free flying. I just do a sign here, but proceed with caution here. That may be just different to what we had above. Um, so essentially, what we do there is nothing else than taking uh, this uh, this simulated system here and driving it with some uh, arbitrary control inputs that we assign here. We drive it with some control again, and this is informed or scaled by the difference of y hat and y. And that's essentially a tracking control task. Essentially, what we would like to do is we would like to drive our system's output close to y of k here, of the measurements. And um, that's, of course, coupled because we have our plant, our true plant up here, and we drive that with the same input. And um, that produces our output with some noise and some errors and so on. So um, if we close this feedback loop down here, um, in the perfect case, in, in our design, uh, we had many cancellations where the plant model was the same as described by H and G in our case. But that's not necessarily the case. And if these terms do not cancel out, then we get a control error. And similar to when you have a model error in just state feedback design, you will um, have uh, errors affecting your stability here in the end. If, if you would take a too aggressive observer design here, it may very well be that if the, if the plant models are sufficiently far from each other, that you get actually an unstable observer loop here. So that's why you don't take a dead beat observer design every time, all the time. In this particular case, <coughs> we had a model which is more or less trivial. It's a double integrator. And this double integrator actually is essentially parameter free. It's, it is just a double integrator. There is nothing more to it. There, is, there are no other scalings that come into it as model errors. So there it may very well make sense to use a dead beat controller. Whereas in other cases, or even if you have model errors like unknown time delays, if you have one more C to the minus one somewhere, a dead beat observer can actually be just, just break by that. Um, and an aggressive observer as well. So that's why you would you, you safely tune your uh, observer dynamics with respect to the model errors that you face anyway somehow. If in, in, the, in the perfect world, um, you can always take arbitrary fast dynamics and it's the same for control, feedback control design as well as for observer design. Next time we will dive into the next chapter, optimal control, which is a very exciting one. And um, I always um, have this saying, it, it basically brought us to the moon. It was effectively um, the space race in the 1960s, um, in which, 50s and 60s, in which optimal control principles have been established and um, researched for the first time. And a lot of results came up there. And the famous, the famous uh, linear quadratic regulator um, is a very well known and widely adopted optimal controller and we will look into how this uh, control design works and what it achieves um, and how we can work with it.